His new book, The Gift of Influence, um, your publisher sent me an advanced copy, so I had a chance to read it. Um, most people do not think of themselves as influential. What would you say to those people? You are. That's the whole book. Everyone's a gift. Everybody can have influence. Yeah. The first thing we just got to do is we got to hijack the word back. Yes. Influencer, you actually look up the dictionary. Yeah. How many hits you have, social media, how many likes you have. Yep. How much crap can you sell on the internet? I mean, I don't know the Kardashians, but they're always the, the target. But you know, like internet's like that. You want to be selling stuff. And that's not what an influencer is. An influencer is when you change someone's life through loving them and serving them and making a, a contribution to their heart. You know, that's not how many likes you have. We tried so hard, Jill and I, we never gave our kids phones until they went to high school. They were the only kids in the whole eighth grade that had a phone. We have no technology, no video games. We really tried hard to hide them from that, but now Caroline's on TikTok. Now Caroline's, or Tate's on Instagram. It's how the kids communicate on the, on the, on the skates team. And I just see it just really eating at them. Yeah. It's, it's the devil in the pocket. And I know technology is so important and it's so good. I can, I can travel the world with my family to be on vacation and check in with work. I get the positives, but I think that the 10, 20, 30, 40 years in that we're going to see a, a huge, um, void in the world with socialization and self-confidence, just with social media. It's, uh, it's awful. Yeah, I mean, there's some real mega themes and yeah. none of them seem to be good uh, when it comes to the fruit of those things. Yeah. Uh, someone reads your new book, The Gift of Influence. They put it down. What do you want them to be thinking and feeling once they finish reading the book? I'm a storyteller and I wanted to write a book that would really move people. And I have a friend, I won't mention his name, but he's a hard ass, a CEO, very successful, military, Stanford, military, you know, hard ass. He, he just cried through the whole book. That's what I wanted. Yeah. Because when you get in their heart and you get them open up about influence. So the stories, just one after the other, right hook, left hook, jab, jab, jab. I mean, just the whole way through. And so at the end, I want people to put the book down and say, I want to make significant influence on the lives of others. Mm. I want to influence my spouse, my children, but my neighbors, people at work, I want to, I want to make a difference. Yeah. yeah. How did writing this book change you? <laughs> well, it's impossible not to be changed when you write a book. Um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, John Gordon, our friend was, was in Denver doing a speech for my, my nonprofit. And he just randomly said in his speech that, in the average human being influences 80,000 people in your life. He just kind of said in his talk, and you know, John, he just talks like no slides. He just thought he's, I love that guy. Yeah. He's a genius. He says that and it, boom, it just hit me. Like the average human being influences 80,000 people in their life. And then, so I did the research. I started becoming obsessed with it and sure that research is correct. And they said the average person lives at 77 years old and if you take 77 years old and divide it by 365 days a year, that's 2.8 people a day. So this research believes that every day we wake up, we meet three new people, 2.8 new people a day. I mean, just think of your day today when you check that here in this plane, this, this coffee shop, this bank, this new employee, like if you take 2.8 people a day times 365 days of the year times 77 years, which is the average life expectancy of a human or in the world, you get exactly 80,000. Oh, I just became obsessed with that. Like 80,000, that's a, that's a big number. Yeah. What if at the end of our life, we actually got to meet these people? Like we don't think about that. We just think about transactions and we meet people, but at the end of our life, what if every single person we've ever met in our life, all three people, actually 2.8 people, times 365 days, times 77 years, all 80,000, what if we got to meet them and say goodbye to them and talk to them? Mm. Like how, would we live differently? Would we lead differently? Would we treat people differently? I started thinking about that. You know how it is when you write a book, you're obsessed about it. 
where would they fit? Or they fit in stadiums? How many stadiums in America? Turns out there's like over 30 stadiums in America that have 80,000 seats. And so they started thinking, what if at the end of our lives, before we go home to our, to our maker, and we all just walk on that 50 yard line of that stadium. Yeah. And every single person that we've met in our life, all 2.8 people a day since we were kindergartners all the way up to in our last breath, all 80,000 people are in that stadium. And we just walk in that stadium, stand that 50 yard line, and everyone is there saying goodbye. And I just, I have a couple questions. <laughs> What's the sound of that stadium? You know, what's the sound of it? I think just cheering and chanting your name. Matthew, Matthew, changed my life. Like, are, are they just clapping because you've made an influence on them? You've stopped to hear their story. You've stopped to listen to them. You've helped them. You've loved them. You've served them. Or is the, are they booing? You just rolled over people most of your life. Yeah. Or is it worse? Is it, is it silent? Like you've been on your phone the whole life and just looking down. And so I wrote this book. It was originally called 80,000. We changed the gift of influence for lots of reasons, but I want people to think about their stadium. Yeah. I want people to think, be very intentional when they wake up every day, the influence that they have, that 2.8 new people are coming in their life. And some stadiums are going to be 80,000. Some are going to be 8 million, 800 million. You're, you're, we're going to need a lot of stadiums for you, Matthew, right? which is awesome. But the average person is gonna have 80,000 people. And I want people to close my book and say, I'm filling my stadium with people that I've changed their life. You talked a lot about um, the transactional nature of relationships um, or even encounters with people in our culture. In the book, you talk about showing up meaningfully for people. What does it mean to show up meaningfully for people? We have this transactional, tendency when people are in pain and people are hurting to say, uh, Matthew, I'm so sorry that your son's going through this. Um, if you need anything, you let me know. Yeah. That is bullshit. I probably have to edit that out. Sorry. Bullshit. <laughs> I'll say it again. <laughs> if there's anything I can do for you, going through a divorce, kids on drugs, just lost your spouse. Yeah. Right. Cancer. Yeah. Right? This stuff happens all the time. If there's anything I can do for you, you let me know. Yeah. We say that all the time, and that's a cop out. What you're really saying is, I care about you, but I'm so busy. So I'm just going to say something that makes you feel that I care. But really, as I hope to God, you don't call me up and ask for something. Yeah. And how many times do you actually call someone up and say, Remember you said if I need anything? Very rarely. No, because you're putting the burden on, on the other person to ask you uh, exactly. to do something for them. Exactly. Yeah. So my friends are in pain. What time can I come over? I know you're busy. I'm coming over. I want to pray with you. Jill's got a meal for you. Um, I want to do this for you. I got this great book I want to get to you about healing, whatever that story is. Yep. And you just say, here's what I'm doing for you. Call up. I'm sorry you're in pain. I I'm going to be there for you. I have a good friend, his name is Scott Wetzel. And um, I want to tell the story right, but it changed my life. He's got boys and um, he's a great guy. He's a banker in town, a great guy. And he and Charlotte raised these kids and his high school student, uh, maybe five, six years ago, was uh, a victim of, um, of uh, cyber bullying. Yeah. He got really bullied and these kids were awful. You're such a wuss. You don't, you don't have, you can't even jump off a bridge, right? And they dared him to go on the bridge mm. and jump and they were on the bottom. Mm. Come on, you wuss. You can't even jump off that bridge. You can't even kill yourself right. What do you think that kid did? He jumped. Wow. Gone. Teddy. And when I talked to my friend years later, he said to me, I know my friends cared. I know that people were saddened for me. But not a lot of people really came because I think like, what do you say to someone? Your son just jumped off the bridge. But you, Tommy, man, you mailed me Steve Otterman's book on healing. You called all the time. You showed up like, man, when people have pain, you yeah. run towards them. You run right in their life. 
and you run alongside of it. I think our intentions are pure, but I think we get scared and we don't know what our place is. And you know, maybe you know, someone else is bringing a meal. But I told you this last night. I told you the whole Brooke Shields story. Yeah. At the ball game. You know, Brooke Shields didn't go to her senior prom in high school. She was on the cover of Teen Magazine, People Magazine. She was the most beautiful six-year-old girl in the world. She just did Blue Lagoon. She was literally the biggest star. And she was a high school student in New Jersey. And no one asked her to the prom. That's why she didn't go. Because everyone, everyone assumed Brooke Shields got a date because she's beautiful. No one asked. You know what? If I knew she needed a date, I would have asked her. <laughs> you can't assume that someone's taking the meal, someone's sending the book, someone's praying, someone's stopping by. When people have pain, you know, intentional, they have meaningful um, effort to, to, to change people's lives by showing up. Yeah. Showing up, Matthew. Yeah. We're really good about saying what we want to do. You need anything, let me know. That ain't showing up. The people in my stadium, they're going to be clapping hard because yeah. they showed up and they showed up for me. Yeah. I got a friend, Marshall. He was uh, Marshall Patani. He was the GM at the Brown Palace. You've stayed there. It's a fancy hotel in Denver. And he was there forever. Like He was the Brown Palace. He, would, he retired. And he called me up one time and said, man, I, I got cancer. I got, I got colon cancer and I got a, I got an operation. And Pam and I, we're just scared. We don't have kids. Like, this is scary for me. When's your surgery? He said some date. Put in the back of my mind. He didn't know this. But I flew down there that morning of surgery. I called Pam up and I said, can I come up? And she's like, Tommy, please come up. When he wheeled out of that surgery, he finally woke up. And there was Pam and there was me at his bedside. Yeah. Oh God. He just cried. I rubbed his feet, loved him, got in a plane, had to go somewhere else. I was busy, as we all are. Yeah. And like a year later, he takes his motorcycle and he drives it, you know, from Scottsdale. He's retired all the way to Denver. And he liked the trip, but he finally got to my house. He gets off there, he gets in the saddle, he pulls out this gorgeous bottle of, of, of bourbon, like a really, really rare bottle. And he said, I wanted, I wanted to hand deliver this to you. And I wanted to drive because I've never had anyone show up for me like that. Mm. I had cancer. When I was there at the operating room, you were there. And uh, I can't even open that bottle up. It sits in my bar. I'm a tequila guy now, but I just look at that bottle and that's that, that's that sacrifice. Show up to people, right? When people are going through something, get on the plane, show up. 